Good morning, afternoon, evening. It's uh, any of that anywhere. So we are worldwide. So for, from wherever you're joining, um, this this is great. I'm very excited. Um, I am Alexander Sietschlag. In case you had any doubt, I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, excited to run this series. And um, I, started, I, I, I decided to, to begin um, starting now, you know, each, each occurrence with a brief quiz. And obviously, you have to answer it right in order to be able to stay on. Otherwise, Brianna will remove you from the meeting. No, just kidding. But um, speaking, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of resilience and all hazards, and today it's, Mar it's, it's March, the 28th of March. So the eyes of March, we have survived, at least we believe, you know, we, we, yeah, we weren't stabbed. So that's a step, that's good. That's encouraging. And um, so 28th of March, regard, related to resilience, what, what day is that? Who can, what Remembrance Day is it? Don't ask ChatGPT. Oh, you could ask ChatGPT. It would be exciting to see what's the answer. So any any suggestions? Put them in the chat while I'll, I don't want to waste our time here because this is exciting. As you know, Resilience Reimagined um, is a, a speaker series, series where we um, invite external expertise to some extent, but to another extent also, um, make accessible and collect, you know, and offer our own expertise. And today is an occurrence where we offer our own expertise um, in, in the speaker series that um, hosts ex esteemed guests, but today they come from our own Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences, esteemed guests being hosted once a month to discuss fresh perspectives on a broad range of resilience topics. Therefore, we consciously do not de define resilience for the purpose of this series. So it is because we are reimagining it also, right? So it doesn't make sense um, for the purpose of the series to start with a um, with a spelled out definition. But the series also supports the strategic vision of our worldwide Embry-Riddle Worldwide College of Arts and Sciences to be a true destination college for multidisciplinary studies and impactful collaborative research as we strive to transform our students and a broader community into responsive, responsible global citizens. And the department that is championing today's occurrence um, has that multidisciplinarity in its name. It is the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. And the department is is led by um, J.R. Henneman, the acting department chair, and J.R. is an assistant professor of the practice for atmospheric science. He will um, take it over for me in just a second and introduce the panelists and then also moderate the panel. Um, unfortunately, um, Most of that um, could be right because, you know, end of March, a couple of things occurred um, at some point in history. But um, on March 28, um, 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear accident Ooh. near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania um, occurred. And um, so that is important because it accelerated the creation of uh, FEMA. That is today, as we know, an operational component of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. It demonstrates how Homeland Security predates 9-11. And um, the TMI case is an interesting teaching case um, also about, um, among other things, um, other than the coordinated response and the federal and state and local response, but about community resilience. And it is very important to me still because um, it occurred basically the accident site was just um, a few miles down um, Susquehanna River from um, Penn State Harrisburg School of Public um, um, Capital College at the School of Public Affairs that for almost 10 years was my tenure home. So very important. And then, but then therefore behavior and social science, community resilience, very important. So with that, um, very 
excited to welcome our esteemed internal guests um, and everybody who joins us, um, our esteemed internal guests from the Embry-Riddle Worldwide College of Arts and Sciences Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. JR, acting chair of the department, please take it away now and thank you. Thank you, Dean Sieglag. Um, I'm going to strict go fully formal because it's being recorded so other people later on will be able to hear it and uh, we'll go with that. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Um, as the Dean said, I'm J.R. Hanneman. I'm the Acting Chair for Behavior and Social Sciences. And um, BSS is the home of the Master of Science in Occupational Safety Management, um, the Master of Science in Human Factors, and the Bachelor of Science in Safety Management. Um, we also host minors in psychology, industrial and organizational psychology, economics, occupational safety and health, and foundations in research inquiry. So. We have a lot uh, going on, a lot to offer. So a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, jump into it. Um, there's time allotted for questions at the end. So uh, if you'll ask or hold your questions until then, but of course you can drop them into the chat at any time and those will be monitored, but do ask that you uh, uh, put in whose name you'd like to have address that question so that can be properly channeled. Okay. Now I'm excited to introduce some of the members of Department of Behavior and Social Sciences to you today to speak on topics that are relevant to both our department and the broader landscape of resilience. And um, do a real quick intro, and then I'll go into more depth intro right before um, I introduce each speaker. So Dr. Audra Sherwood is assistant, assistant professor of the practice in economics. She'll talk about security, risk, resilience in the future of the U.S. Dr. Catherine Kat Moran, associate professor of human Human Performance will speak on human factors design and resilience. Dr. Christina Frederick, Professor of Psychology, will address motivation, psychology, and resilience. And our first speaker, Dr. Donna Roberts. Dr. Roberts is a Professor of Psychology and the Associate Dean for Faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences. She's an active fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and a member of the Embry-Riddle Jack R. Hunt Society. Dr. Roberts has been with Embry-Riddle since 2003 and has held positions ranging from the Associate Discipline Chair of Social Sciences and Economics to Regional Associate Dean, Eastern, or sorry, European Region, to Dean of Academic Affairs, Internal, International Region, to the Interim Dean of this very College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Roberts's research interests encompass various areas of psychology and education, including personality, aviation, consumer, and media psychologies, generational studies, learning styles, and the intersection between psychology and the arts. Dr. Roberts will start us off with the psychology of resilience as soon as I get her the slides. And there we go. Thank you, JR. And hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. So yeah, uh, resilience uh, from a psychological perspective. It's, uh, as, as Alexander mentioned uh, in his, his intro, that uh, resilience is something you can define in many different ways. And uh, it's broad, it's complex, it's multifaceted. Um, and it's one of those things that uh, you kind of know it when you see it, but it can be very hard to capture its comprehensive nature when you try to define it, kind of like other uh, concepts in psychology like intelligence or personality, very pervasive. Um, it, and they look different across different individuals, uh, different organizations, different cultures, different circumstances. So I'm going to start off with a broad overview. And then later, my colleagues will do a deep dive into some very specific aspects. So next, please. So resilience is a concept that's really result, revolved evolved, excuse me, over time and has become relevant and applicable across uh, various, various concept, context. Uh, its initial application, you know, before we started thinking of it in terms of human behavior, it was used in material science um, to describe substances in terms of properties of elasticity and hardiness. And you can see where there's an analogy there. And as we started to look at it in terms of human behavior, the original focus was on children in adverse environments. And we took a look at the idea of how certain children had um, challenging environments with poverty or crime or abuse and neglect or mental illness. 
And some children, however, thrived in those uh, environments. And so we wondered about that. We didn't have the linear, uh, you know, back to the nature nurture concepts. We didn't have the linear relationship between an enriching environment where children thrived and a challenging uh, environment where children didn't thrive. Suddenly we saw children thriving, some children in these challenging environments. So we asked the question, we started to look at the question of why why is that? What happens? Why do certain individuals succeed despite the fact that they're facing these adverse uh, environments? And, and so we started to apply these concepts of resilience to uh, human behavior. We Going along in the evolution uh, in the 80s and 90s, we really looked at uh, resilience in communities. We extended that um, broad microscope and looked at um, what happens when communities bounce back from challenges, uh, things like natural disasters, uh, that's a very common area, um, or man-made disasters like Alexander talked about with the um, uh, with the crisis and economic hardships in some areas too. What about an area that uh, loses their the mainstay of their um, economic life and, and a certain industry uh, that they've been counting on? So we looked at how some communities thrive. Again, the, the same basic question, why do some communities thrive and get past these hardships and others don't seem to? And so today we take this and, and we we look at resilience in many different contexts, um, in education, in health systems, in the military, in all organizations, and still, of course, uh, for the individual as well. All of this evolution shows us that we can look at resilience um, from a many different perspectives, and it depends on how you focus the microscope. So we can look at it in a very micro level or all the way expand it to a very macro level. And on the micro level, again, we're looking at the individual, the characteristics and behaviors that make someone um, adapt well and thrive in the face of adversity. And so that's kind of what we think of in terms of psychology of an individual and um, attributes related to resilience in this, in this level, in this context, um, self-efficacy, um, locus of control, optimism, adaptability, things like that, as well as uh, our problem solving skills and our critical thinking and certainly emotional regulation. So all of those kinds of things are, are ways that we looked at we, and are looking at my, um, the my micro aspect of resilience at the micro level, the individual. But we can expand that out. Next slide, please. And so we can start looking at the uh, the application in broader and broader contexts. So meso, macro, uh, we start to pull that out for anywhere from the individual, then in families, immediate families, extended families, friend groups, other interest groups, uh, communities, um, organizational groups, and uh, all the way to a larger society and even globally. So resilience, again, is such a broad concept that we apply it at all of these levels. And uh, at the macro level, we're looking at larger systemic factors, cultural norms, social policies, politics, economics, all of those other aspects um, that of a wider community. And we look at these different aspects. Uh, we talk about in resilience theory, things that are protective factors that enhance uh, our resilience at any level or risk factors that are offer a challenge to uh, our resilience. And what we find is that at the different levels, these the, the item itself can sometimes be a risk factor and sometimes be a protective factor. So for instance, family influences, think back to the, uh, the evolution of uh, the application of resilience to human behavior with children. Children with solid family structures with supportive caregivers, obviously that's a protective factor. That's a thing that will enhance their resilience. But with a family structure that may, is, may be abusive or neglectful or have uh, mental illness in that structure, then it becomes a risk factor. So these, again, can uh, evolve and apply across the different uh, levels of macro and micro. 
And of course, uh, while we study these, while we break these down into these different categories, they are they don't operate in, in isolation. They are interactive. Um, they work in tandem with each other. They have a reciprocal effect so that a supportive community, again, is going to be a protective factor to enhance someone's uh, resilience, but also that individual, as they are resilient and contribute to the community, they enhance community resilience. So there's definitely uh, this relationship that exists uh, between these. I like to think of this oftentimes, um, an analogy, you know, the, the mobiles that they hang above um, children's cribs, baby's cribs, um, so that a lot of moving parts, right? A lot of pieces there, um, but one system. And it is definitely responds to um, external factors. If a breeze comes through, um, it's going to move those different parts. And if you tug on one piece, you're not going to just affect that one piece. Um, you're going to affect the whole system. So again, that interrelationship and how they interact with each other um, all uh, provide provides a context for understanding how multifaceted the, the concept of resilience is across these different levels. Uh, another way to think about these levels of resilience is if we think about it in the context of, say, for example, the pandemic we've experienced. And we think about how individual resilience, how we had to respond as individuals to that in terms of our own uh, family situations, our own health situations, all of those pieces that affected us as an individual, but also all the organizations we were a part of had to respond to that. All the workplaces, all the industry had to respond to these challenges that were put forth um, from the pandemic. And the communities had to respond as well, had to think about how to distribute resources in a different way, how to respond to uh, the challenges and the crisis that came along. And all of those pieces, like that mobile, uh, had an effect on each other. So things could be going along and you could be adapting. You were able to find resources and deal with you know, your work situation and your family situation. And suddenly someone in the family falls ill. That changes things. That's a tug on one of those pieces of that mobile that's going to affect uh, everything there. So again, each piece of this is its own element, like on the mobile, um, but they contribute to a holistic understanding of all of the ways in which um, these pieces uh, adapt together and work together. Next slide, please. Again, if we think of it from a perspective of individual uh, resilience, uh, there's also uh, different dimensions of that. The psychological resilience um, in terms of cognitive responses, um, emotional processes, things like emotional regulation, coping strategies, that's very closely tied to mental health. Um, we have our physical health as well. And that is, uh, with respect to resilience, stress and our reaction to stress is a very big part of that as well as all of the physiological uh, reactions that we have with respect to different stressors. And then, of course, again, focusing the microscope broader, we talk about our societal and cultural context and how that affects the individual. Another aspect of the evolution of our understanding of resilience is the idea that it is a dynamic process. And uh, much like how we have uh, how we originally thought about the concept of intelligence as this one static fixed trait for some, for individuals. We thought about resilience about that before that way before. And we've come to realize again that like intelligence, it's much more of a dynamic process. There's an interplay, there's an interaction of all these factors we've already talked about uh, that influence our level of resilience across different context and at different times. So you can display certain resilience in a particular time and place and a particular challenge, and later on a different level, uh, certainly of resilience. And um, that leads us to uh, ways in which we can, all of this, you know, conceptualizing the different pieces of this help us figure out um, what's important to put forward for our resources. How can we um, tailor interventions? How can we um, put programs together that are going to make a difference here? So again, a lot of interrelated elements um, from the individual to the larger society to global 
um, and all of them affecting each other. And so this is a dynamic process, again, can change over time, uh, can change in relation to obviously to the intensity or, or the, the specifics of the uh, ad adversity that is facing us, but also with respect to each of those elements and how we can enhance them. So really the big takeaways here when we talk about this in, in a broad sense, are the ideas that you know it's resilience isn't universally defined. It has to be understood contextually, both individually, contextually, and at the larger, um, the larger context uh, in society with all of those moving parts. So it might look different for individuals. It might look different in different situations, and it might look different in different times or cultures. And so this is a, a malleability. The idea that it's dynamic again gives us the positive effect that. Um, it's not static and we can find ways to cultivate resilience. We can take a look at those factors. What are protective factors? What are risk factors? How can we harness those uh, and target interventions for individuals, uh, for um, communities, for organizations, um, public policy, community support structures, again, individual interventions. All of these are possible because we start to look at all of the pieces of this very complex mobile. So um, again, that's a pretty broad view of how we consider uh, the psychology of resilience uh, and my colleagues will proceed with a deep dive into some more specific aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Next is going to be Dr. Christina Frederick. Uh, Dr. Frederick is a professor of psychology and senior faculty research mentor in the College of Arts and Sciences. She received her PhD from the University of Rochester, where she was a member of the Self-Determination Theory Motivation Research Group. Dr. Frederick held positions, uh, faculty positions in Southern Utah University and the University of Central Florida before joining Ember-Riddle in 2000, where her work focused on applied motivation. From 2004 to 2012, she served in various roles in academic administration, including interim provost and senior executive vice president for academics and research. Dr. Frederick's current research interests examine technology use and personality, subjective vitality, team motivation, and leadership. Dr. Frederick is active in the Society of Psychologists and Leadership and serves as a faculty volunteer for Psychi, the National Honor Society in Psychology. Dr. Frederick will be addressing motivation, psychology, and resilience. Dr. Frederick. Thank you, JR. Uh, I have to say that Alexander's comment about the Ides of March just took me back to high school Latin class, my two years with Miss Arnold, and got me thinking about how Caesar was not so resilient that day. But, um, you know, the Roman Empire survived a bit longer. And, uh, you know, most of us who took Latin from Miss Arnold also did eventually pass. <laughs> but we did have Ides of March parties. Um, so my talk today is going to focus on a very specific motivational perspective and how it relates to resilience. So if we want to kind of, if you want to frame it um, in and, and place it within Donna's, uh, Dr. Roberts' previous talk, it's really focusing on a micro level. But I think, it, I hope um, that it will present a theoretical perspective that's very engaging and also very applicable and could be used um, in future studies related to resilience. So um, I, hope, I hope people have questions and will wanna discuss this further afterwards. All right, so a couple assumptions that I wanna start with. So in my talk, resilience is defined as the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. So this is a very psychological uh, definition. In fact, it is um, the American Psychological Association's definition of resilience. And that's really where, um, you know, the, the, the motivation theory that I'm presenting uh, is embedded. Um, so a couple other assumptions following this is that psychological well-being will facilitate resilience, individual resilience, and third, that psychological well-being can be understood and studied in this framework of self-determination theory. 
And so um, really that's the focus of today's talk. I'm gonna talk about self-determination theory, some of the assumptions and, and what, it, what it is and then how it relates to resilience. In self-determination theory, the assumption is that the basic foundation of the theory is that humans have three basic psychological needs, not denying that there are other types of needs, physiological needs or safety needs or some of the other things that other theorists mention. But in this theory, they're focused on individual psychological needs. And those three needs are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Autonomy is the notion that we have choice, that we have agency in our behaviors, that at least for many of the things that we do, that we have some belief that we are choosing to do those and that they have meaning for us. Um, competence is our belief and our knowledge about our effectiveness and our mastery, right? We all need to be effective and master uh, elements of our, of our environments. And most of us have had mastery experiences that make us feel um, positive about ourselves. And the third basic psychological need is the need for relatedness, which is our connection with others. We need to have uh, emotional, affectionate, social connections with other people uh, to fulfill that psychological need. Um, our environments then, both what we could, would consider our internal environment, right? The things that we believe about ourselves, the self-talk, that we have about ourselves, the thoughts that we have about ourselves, the cognitions, right? And the external environment, our immediate external environment, things like what our family and friends say about us or, or what they do to support us or don't support us, what happens at school or work, right? These, both of these environments, both our internal environment and our external environment, can either support or thwart the fulfillment of these three basic psychological needs, right? And so I presented an example at the bottom. I mean, this is, you know, something that easily a, a, a teenager or preteen could hear from a parent or a teacher, you know, you aren't smart enough to be an engineer, right? Can lead to, which is an external, right, influencer, can lead to a belief that I'm not smart enough, which is an internal influencer. And both of those combined can thwart a belief in competence. So would thwart or take away um, that, that fulfillment of that psychological need. Um, so that, I mean, that's an easy example um, to see how competence can be thwarted. Uh, when you have coercion though, uh, that oftentimes thwarts autonomy, right? Especially as adults, we don't like to be coerced. We like to have some sense of choicefulness and, um, the psychological need for autonomy is thwarted when some measure of, ex especially external coercion, although it could be internal, um, occurs. And relatedness um, can be thwarted by experiencing conditions such as ostracism or isolation or rejection from groups. Those are all ways in which we don't find ourselves uh, reaching our needs or achieving our needs or relatedness. So with those three basic needs, right, when those are met, we're more likely to experience positive individual outcomes. And I would like to say that self-determination theory is a very um, robust uh, theory, but it's also very robust in terms of the research being done. Um, there's 50 years of research in self-determination theory. It's a continually evolving theory based on uh, empirical, mostly quantitative research. And uh, every couple of years, there's a, a conference just for people <laughs> who do their research like me within this theory. And there's about 600 to 1,000 people all, from all over the world that really focus our research um, and try to, try to really support the tenets of the theory and applied in different domains. And so self-determination theory has also been applied in a variety of domains, including you know, personal levels of psychological fulfillment, um, work domains, uh, education is another big one, healthcare um, is also a large area where work is being done using self-determination theory. So in general, what we know is that when those three psychological needs are met, we're more likely to experience uh, higher levels of self-esteem, higher levels of engagement in our daily lives and our activities, as well as higher levels of enjoyment 
from those activities. We have report lower levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. And oftentimes we report higher levels of this thing we call intrinsic motivation. Um, so intrinsic motivation is an internalized form of motivation, uh, primarily uh, achieved when we have autonomy and we experience competence together in our activities. Um, and in addition, self-determination theory has spoken to um, greater levels of resilience that comes, especially when we have achieved environments or situations where we experience some kind of need fulfillment or have intrinsic motivation, we know that in those situations, individuals will show greater effort in their activities. They will persist longer. Um, they are honestly have a more realistic and oftentimes less biased interpretation of adversity. So when they interpret incoming information, they don't interpret it negatively to the self, but use it or or to control the self, but use it to inform the self, which is a vastly different way of interpreting information. And so you end up having this informational and process-oriented perspective versus an ego-controlling and outcome-focused perspective, which is a much healthier, um, the previous is a much healthier psychological uh, state. So to tie self-determination theory to resilience, right? The belief is that in order to build a healthy self system that will withstand the stressors that life throws us, we need to begin by supporting and focusing on those three basic psycho psychological needs in people. So to the extent that we can measure and then continue to foster, right, through individual or community-based programs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness in people, right, that's going to lead to greater psychological health. And those could be those, some of those variables could be measured by looking at people's persistence levels in important activities related to resilience, looking at their uh, amount of effort they put forth and looking at their cognitions, what they're saying about those efforts, which then hopefully will lead to greater resilience. And I think there really is a, could be a very vibrant future for using this theory in exploring the relationship between basic psychological need fulfillment and levels of resilience in several populations. So for instance, survivors of natural disasters, right? We oftentimes, um, you know, they're, they're, how often are we measuring the psychological need fulfillment of people who have survived natural disasters? Or are we even targeting those psychological needs as something we should be targeting in order for people to recover more quickly. Um, you know, another group would be geographically displaced persons or politically disenfranchised groups. If we could perhaps focus on the development of a healthier psychological environment in terms of the focus on those three basic psychological needs, we should be able to see a transition into healthier outcomes and greater resilience in those groups. Um, to my knowledge, no one in the self-determination theory framework that I'm aware of um, is using this framework to actually talk about resilience. So I think this could be a really interesting and, and very new and very timely um, area of research to explore. That's it. Thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, talking to people at the end or after the after the talk too. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Appreciate it. Um, next up, our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Kat Moran. Uh, Dr. Moran is an Associate Professor of Human Performance and is the Associate Program Chair for the Master of Science in Human Factors. Dr. Moran has been with Ember-Riddle since 1995 and has served in a variety of roles from Aeronautics Department Chair to Western Region Dean of Academic Affairs, to Program Chair for first the Master of Science in Occupational Safety Management, and then Master of Science in Human Factors. Dr. Moran served in the United States Air Force and Air National Guard for 20 years in the fields of F-15 avionics, av aviation safety, occupational safety, and aircraft accident investigation. Dr. Moran also worked as a trauma epidemiologist on an Alaskan Aviation Safety Initiative with the Center of Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, with which she co-authored co -authored a publication. 
Dr. Moran's research has been published in several peer-reviewed journals, including the American Journal of Epidemiology and Aviation Space and Environmental Medicine Journal. Dr. Moran's topic is Human Factors Design and Resilience. Dr. Moran. Thank you, JR. I appreciate that. Um, what great segues uh, we had, even from the beginning with the Dean speaking to uh, what Remembrance This Day is with Three Mile Island. Uh, that's kind of a, a, a perfect way into what I'm going to talk about, which is basically considering human factors designs um, as relate to resilience and systems. Um, another good one, aside from Three Mile Island, would also be Chernobyl. Uh, the event itself was uh, drastically associated with human error, but uh, the response to it and the recovery from, from it and the reason that it was as bad as it was from a perspective of those that lived there was because of failures um, from a, uh, a systemic perspective, um, looking at how human performance um, was you know, a part of the whole mix. So what we're looking at is resilience in systems, but in order for a system to be resilient, especially in uh, non-standard and in, in emergency procedures, uh, we have to look at the human. The human needs to be resilient. So how the system interfaces with the human is a key component to the resilience of the system itself. So what are some of the challenges? You know, we're talking about human-centered systems um, and the design of those human-centered systems. Um, we can also refer to it as complex socio-technical systems where the humans interface with very technical systems. And anymore, there's almost no systems uh, that doesn't have an advanced level of, of uh, technology. But what we're seeing is increasingly complex socio-technical systems. Um, it, the complexity of the systems themselves is growing, but we're also seeing changes in the types of technology. We're seeing increased um, usage or implementation of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed realities, um, automation, uh, artificial intelligence. So that is making our systems more complex, especially from the perspective of how we are uh, trying to match up and with how the, the humans are gonna interface. So frequently what we're seeing when we're seeing these type of failures either in the system itself or in the response or recovery from an event is that there was a mismatch between components of the system and the human. Um, another thing that we're seeing is variances in system expectations. Um, you know, this changes across time, uh, but it also changes across um, you know, the type of industry it is. Uh, we're also seeing changing perspectives on work-life balance. This is something that really came out more um, from the perspective of, uh, of COVID and since then, um, and, and with some of the younger generations coming into the workplace. So this um, significantly impacts what we can expect from, again, from that socio-technical perspective, that interface between the human and how they fit in with the components of a system. One of the big ones that we're seeing and that we've always seen actually is just individual human variability. Uh, you know, we can speak to, and I will speak to some of the aspects of cognition and physiology and psychology and that type of thing. And there's some standards there. Um, for example, um, generally we need eight hours of sleep a night. Uh, you know, that varies somewhat from person to person, but you know, it's a baseline of eight hours. And from that physiological need, what we see is um, when we don't get that, then we start to have failures in other systems. We can have advanced physiological issues, diseases, that type of thing, um, but it also impacts our cognitive processes. Um, now, where the variability comes in is we see degradation in things like cognitive processes with age, with illness, with nutrition, with diet, with uh, fitness levels. Um, even with our, our capability to cope with stress. You know, we all have different mechanisms of how we, we cope with stress. One, you probably heard the fight or flight, but there's also flee and fawn. There's, there's, there's different aspects of it. Um, so when it comes to an event like a Chernobyl, um, how a person responds to stress under the, under, you know, under the gun is really going to impact the resilience of the system overall. Um, so age is a big one with human variability, experience, knowledge level, our own physiology, those types of things. So that has to be considered, and it's difficult to do that when we're all different. So while we're seeing all those things, the other aspect is system designers really have a, a relatively limited knowledge 
in human cognition and human physiology. They may have a better understanding in the biomechanics, how a human fits onto a desk or into a car or those, those types of things are generally built into systems, but less so are they looking at the cognitive perspective, the physiological aspect, and even the psychological aspect in what human abilities are from those perspectives and what their limitations are. So having said that, um, let's look at what ICAO has said. Um, this is relatively recent. ICAO is the International Civil Aviation Organization, and they're like the umbrella organization, uh, a global organization that tries to ensure that we have a level of consistency um, in regulations and, and guidance for the entire uh, commercial air transportation system. So they have recently um, given more acknowledgement to the importance of human factors in uh, air transportation in all, all aspects, from airports to air traffic control to, uh, to flights to airlines, uh, safety management systems, that type of thing. So they've come up with these five principles, which I think are important to remember um, as it relates to how the resilience in a system. So the first one is that people's performance is shaped by their capabilities and limitations. So this goes right back to what I just said about our cognitive capabilities, our physiological capabilities, our, our psychological capabilities, but also those limitations that go with it. Um, the second is that people interpret sit situations differently and how they interpret those situations, it will depend, it basically is how they're going to perform in those scenarios. And some of that goes back to stress responses, um, but it's really just how a person um, interprets. One of the cognitive processes is risk management. So how people, uh, whatever a person's individual risk management process is, they may see one thing as more risky. Um, uh, but then again, some people are just more risk tolerant and some are more, more risk adverse. So that individual interpretation of situations really plays into performance. Uh, the third one is that people adapt to meet the demands um, of complex and dynamic uh, work environments. Um, there are limitations to that adaptation as well. And that goes back to um, basically the skills, the training, the experience, the education, as well as things like illness, injury, fatigue, um, circadian dysrhythmia, working night shifts, that kind of thing is, um, can change how well uh, people adapt to, uh, to systems. So uh, the fourth one is that people assess risks and make trade-offs. And that's one of the things I just talked about when we were looking at the, uh, the second one about interpreting situations is how I assess a risk. Um, it may be different than how Dr. Frederick would assess the exact same scenario and the risk for her. And then we make trade-offs um, in our performance, what we're willing to do, what we're not willing to do, what we think is safe for ourselves to do that type of thing. The final one is that people's performance is influenced by um, the components of the system itself. So working with other people, working with the technology itself and the environment of that system. So those are all important to keep in mind. So um, as we're designing systems, that's a lot to consider. So keeping that in mind, um, I put this together, I call it a degree of fit. And so basically what I'm talking about is the fit between the human component and the system components. So on the left, we're looking at the human component. And these are some limitations um, it, that are influenced by cognitive, uh, physiological, psychological, and ergonomic factors. And, and this, I talked to some of these, but again, age, your health, your fitness, your, your diet, uh, your anthropometry, which is the measure of a person, how tall you are, your, your arm reach, that type of thing. Stress and stress responses, our coping mechanisms that we're all built with, our education, our experience, um, sleep hygiene, um, meaning you know the hygiene processes that we follow to go to bed at night and not staring at our phones with that bright wake me up light. Um, and then there's human abilities, you know. So we have our human abilities, um, but then over on the system components, that is on the right side. So we've got operating environments, uh, hardware, software, the actual mission, materials, organizational factors, um, advanced technologies, shift work, the complexity of the tasks that they're doing, even things like the regulations, scheduling. Those are all the system components to consider. So as we come down from those two aspects of systems and we look at human abilities and the system demands, that's where the balance lies based on all those other factors. That's where the balance lies. And that brings us down to the degree of fit. 
It is that degree of fit that predicts the performance outcomes for that system, but not just the performance outcomes, but also the user experience for whatever system or whatever piece of equipment that you have. It could even be a cell phone. So that's what I, I refer to as a degree of fit, seeing how well these things match up. Okay, so having said all that, um, basically what we're looking at is how do we optimize system design for resilience? And again, um, not just for the performance of the system, but for the performance of the system, especially when it comes down to a, a non-standard or emergency procedure. That's when we truly want our systems to be as resilient as possible. And of course, we need our humans to be resilient also. So it, it speaks to the design of the system taking into consideration all those aspects that we've talked about from a human perspective. So human factors principles look at the cognition, the physiology, um, the psychology, the ergonomics. We look at all of those factors and we consider how that human behavior works or matches up with the design of the system processes, the tasks, the environments, the regulations, the, sh the shift work, whatever the case may be. So understanding those key components is um, is is what's going to lead us to how humans are going to interact within that system and with the different components of that system. That's where we get the system um, optimization from. But it's also that piece that allows us to mitigate human error. So to try and prevent it at the outset, as opposed to always chasing down, trying to control um, the human performance aspect and trying to put controls in place to fix um, previous instances of human error. So we want that uh, mitigation piece in there. But it also enhances cognitive processes within that system. And then obviously the greater uh, system from the perspective of stability and resilience uh, in the face of threats and vulnerabilities. And so uh, that's my that's my talk, and hopefully if anybody has any questions specific to the design of a system and, and uh, system resilience, uh, as reflects from human performance resilience, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. And I uh, hope these perspectives have enhanced the resilience conversation and encouraged new insights and directions to explore. So back to you, Alexander. It's definitely been an eye opener for a lot of us here. And um, if you have uh, some time, um, I mean, I can always at the academic quarter, I don't know about you, but I think based on these, um, considering these high quality contributions, it would be appropriate to allow for a little Q&A. From Adam E, we have a question here to Audra. Um, Audra, regarding your water conservation efforts, have we considered using reverse osmosis systems industrially to create drinkable water from seawater? Do you know what, Adam? I, I do believe that is being, um, that is something that California and Nevada are definitely looking into. Um, definitely, they're looking at the idea of being able to uh, turn seawater into water for irrigation, because we definitely have to be concerned about the agricultural industry in the United States, because we know that agricultural uh, production is down because of COVID, uh, because of inclement weather. So uh, definitely, we want to be able to consider that, yes. That, I want to um, thank JR very much for moderating us through this session of uh, Resilience Reimagined and showcasing our very own expertise out of the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Thanks, all panelists. We hope to see you next week, um, in particular on the 3rd of, I said March, but it's obviously April, on the 3rd of April with the, the College of Arts and Sciences Research Council sponsored panel on Ask the Editors. With that, thank you for attending and um, be good, be safe. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. And thanks, JR and team. Thank you.